Hey, and welcome to Untethered with Jen Liss, the podcast that's here to help you break free, be you, and unleash your inner brilliance. I'm your host, Jen, and in this episode, we're going to talk about how falling in love with the process can help you achieve your greatest goals. Let's dive in. Hey there, Unicorn. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm so excited to welcome today's guest, Alan Stein Jr. So Alan spent 15 plus years working with the highest performing basketball players on the planet, including NBA superstars, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, and Kobe Bryant. He has now taken his knowledge and his expertise to help individuals and organizations maximize their performance. He has so many good nuggets to share with us. And what I really appreciate about this conversation with Alan is that he is so honest about his own unique journey, his own challenges that he is still moving through, and the ways in which showing up today is supporting him in becoming an even greater self in the future and how he can contribute now, today, exactly where he is. And I hope you really take that away for yourself as well, that exactly who you are today can contribute, that exactly who you are today can contribute so much to the world and tomorrow even greater and even greater and even greater. The mentality that he shares, I think we can all take something just really magical away for ourselves. So he knows his stuff and he's really looking forward to sharing it with you today. Everyone, welcome to the podcast, Alan Stein Jr. Hi, Alan. Hey, it's so great to be with you. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have you here on the podcast. I was just sharing with you before you hopped on, like you're a unique individual to come on this podcast. And a lot of the listeners here are, we are people who really want to live our most brilliant lives. We want to look back and say, dang, that was a well-lived, really amazing life. And you're out there in the world helping people to improve their performance and to support them in really living what I, I'm curious what you think, but seems to be their most brilliant lives as well. Absolutely. And you can add me to that list uh, that you already you know, said. I mean, I, my goal is to live the most brilliant and fulfilling uh, life that I'm capable of. So yeah, I love any discussion under that umbrella of how we can be our best selves, live our best lives. And uh, you know, the beautiful part is we don't have to be too consumed with yesterday or last year or even a decade ago. I mean, we can we can learn lessons from those times, but we can recalibrate and refocus and start living our best life uh, in a moment whenever we choose to. And I'm I'm thankful that I'm making that choice, you're making that choice and all of your listeners and viewers are making that choice as well. That's why we're here is to talk about that and all the ways that we can do that. So, I'd really curious, you have helped coaches, you've helped basketball players really to do what it is that they do. Can can just for the listeners, because we often wonder how do people get to where they are? And so I'd love to hear even just a little sprig of how is it that you came to be a speaker and a performance coach and to speak on this topic that you speak about? Sure. I'll give you the super cliff notes version. And then if there's any threads you want to pull on and dive deeper, I'm always open to doing that. Uh, so for context, basketball was my first love. And I fell in love with the game at five years old. And I'm so thankful that here four decades plus later, uh, basketball is still a major uh, passion and pillar in my life. So I spent the first third of my life as a very dedicated basketball player, uh, was able to play collegiately at Elon College. It's now Elon University down in North Carolina. And while I was at Elon, I started to develop an equal love for the training side of the game. Uh, strength, conditioning, fitness, mindset, nutrition. So I decided when I graduated in the late 90s, what could be better than combining my original love of basketball with this newfound love of performance training and strength and conditioning. So I became a basketball performance coach. Uh, I did that for the next 20 years of my life and chose to focus primarily at the high school level because that was the age where I felt I could have the biggest impact, not only on the court, but off the court as well. And then in 2017, um, after a basketball training career, I decided to make a very intentional pivot to become a corporate keynote speaker and take all of the lessons and strategies and concepts that I had learned from some really renowned players and coaches 
and teach folks how to apply those to their lives and to their businesses. So I've, I'm have i going into year eight now as a corporate keynote speaker and author and absolutely loving it. Uh, but I you know, am still drawing on my passion for basketball and the lessons that I learned from the game. So even though I don't do anything in the basketball space anymore, other than just cheer my own children on when they play, I still feel very, very connected to the game. And, and I'm very thankful that, that that passion has been with me for you know almost 50 years now. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your journey that has gotten you here. I think it can be really helpful when we're, no matter what level we're at or where we're at in our own, in our own unique journey, but there's a lot of listeners of this podcast who, you know, want to be speakers or maybe want to start a podcast or maybe want to do some corporate speaking. So it's so supportive for you to share that. And with that, if I can pull one tiny thread, if you're willing to share along that journey, when you made that pivot, into corporate speaking. Was there something that for you was like, oh, this was the hardest part, or I didn't quite expect this. And if there was something that kind of like was hard for you, how did you get through that? Nothing jumps out as being specifically hard or or very acute. It it was incredibly hard, but I knew it was going to be hard going into it. So I, I think I kind of over indexed my expectations. I mean, it's my approach to it was one of tremendous humility. I mean, I I've always known uh, and still am re- you know reminded to this day that unless you are a celebrity, which I certainly am not, unless you're just retiring from the NBA or you were the last bachelor or bachelorette or you you landed a plane on the Hudson River, if you don't have some level of celebrity, it takes a long time to build up a very thriving and successful speaking practice. I mean, there is there is a process and a timeline, and there really are no shortcuts again, unless you are, you're famous. So um, I knew that going into it and I have such a strong respect and appreciation for the process in any area of life. I'm a process guy that that I knew that it was going to be something that incrementally and systematically I would progressively build over time. Um, and, and I didn't know exactly where I'd be in year three or year five or year eight, but I knew that I wanted that arrow to keep pointing up and that I wanted to keep working on my craft, keep growing my business. And, and it's, it's doing just that. And it's kind of neat. I'm in a sweet spot now. So 2024 will be year eight for me. And, uh, you know, part of it seems like it's flown by, but then part of it seems like I've been doing this forever. You know, I have enough reps under my belt that that I feel very confident and very comfortable in this space and certainly on stage, but I still have by choice uh, a, a rookie mentality, a, a learner's mindset. I mean, I literally just got back from Arizona yesterday at, at the time of this recording. Uh, I attended a two-day speaker boot camp where, where speakers go to learn more about the craft and to network with other speakers. And, you know, I, I was approaching that like it was day one for me. And I, I always want to have that beginner's mindset, always want to stay open to learning. Um, but at the same time, realize that I am gaining experience. I am gaining reps. Every time I step on or off stage, I'm slowly moving a little bit closer um, to the speaker that I'm trying to become. So uh, it's been exactly as hard as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think for the listeners, a couple of active reflections here and what you've shared First of all, we're about to dive into what it is that you love to teach people and what you love to speak about. And you're walking that talk. I have a good feeling. You're actively walking the message that you teach. And I think that's so important for us to be congruent there. You know, you're you're continuing to learn, you're continuing to grow. You know that this is a challenge. So you're forming the habits and you're doing all of the things. So I think that that's something we <laughs> It, it's challenging and it is hard and we can expect it to be hard and we can fall in love with that process. And that's something that you mentioned early on too. It's like you fell in love with the training, with the, with all of the learning. And it seems like you're still actively doing that. Oh, I most certainly am. You know, in fact, if if someone was at whatever to ask me, what are some of the keys to not only high performance and productivity, but but to fulfillment, one of the the recommendations I'd make is learn to love the work learn to love the process. We, we happen to live in a world and a society that over-indexes the result and, and the outcomes. And those things are important. And I would never in a million years say that results and outcomes aren't important. I'm a realist. I know how important those things are. But if your sole uh, sense of self-worth and confidence uh, and, and belief always hinges on the outcomes, then you live a life 
it's like a roller coaster and it'll constantly ebb and flow. Whereas if you can learn to love the actual work, you learn to love the process, you, you learn to love the hard stuff, then you've already won in advance. You know, I, I enjoy every aspect of the speaking industry. Now, again, I'm a realist. This doesn't mean I love every moment of my life all of the times. I mean, we all have things that that we need to do that we don't necessarily love, but generally speaking, I love every aspect of the speaking business. By the time I step on stage for any given group or event, that's literally just the reward for all of the work that was put in before getting there. You know, that's that's my game if you want to reference, you know, sports or basketball. Um, that's the cherry on top of the Sunday. I enjoy everything that leads up to that. I enjoy the 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 promotion process and trying to the sales process of trying to attract new clients. Uh, I enjoy doing my due diligence and learning about every organization I work with, you know, find out what their challenges are, what their pain points are, you know, how their team feels about their organization or what needs to be celebrated. I enjoy coming up with new content. I enjoy rehearsing and telling stories. So I love doing all of that stuff. So again, by the time I step on stage, my self-worth and my enjoyment and my fulfillment is not hinging on whether or not I get a standing ovation. That, that again, can just be a cherry on top of a Sunday. I've already won before I've even gotten there because I've loved the process. And as cliche as it sounds, you know, I, I love the journey. You know, if you only focus on the destination, I think you're missing out on, on so many things that life has to offer. So in any line of work or any industry or vocation, I think you need to learn to love love that process. And, and that can also be a red flag if you might be going down the wrong path or in the wrong industry or at the wrong organization. If you simply loathe the work and the process and you're just you know trying to grip onto a couple of things that are outcome oriented to have any level of happy, happiness or fulfillment, then it might be time to make a pivot. It might be time to find something else. Oh, that's really juicy what you just said there, because the question that I have for you is, what if I'm not enjoying the process? I'm not loving the process. It's so obvious that you are fully in your purpose and you are doing exactly what you are meant to do. What about the person that we are maybe focusing a lot on the outcome and we're not loving the process? Are there any little tips that you have that can help us to fall in love with it? Or do you think that it's maybe this isn't what you are supposed to be doing at all. How do we decipher there? Do you have any thoughts there? I sure do. Well, ultimately what we're talking about is kind of a form of, of burnout. And that was one of the, the main pillars of my most recent book uh, is, is taking a look and uncovering burnout. And I've experienced burnout at a couple of different times in, in my life. I mean, one uh, as a basketball player, and that happened in college. The second, and I, I didn't mention this earlier, when I made the pivot from basketball training to corporate keynote speaker, uh, the impetus for that was burnout. I was starting to get burnt out on being in the gym and being in the weight room and being around 15 and 16 year old male basketball players 24 seven. I was just ready to do something different. So, um, so any of the things that I share on stage or on page are things that I've experienced firsthand. You know, I, I talk a lot to my audiences about having a winner's mindset and not blaming, complaining, or making excuses. Well, if you knew me 25 years ago, I was the king of blaming, complaining, and making excuses. I would always deflect accountability and responsibility. It was always someone else's fault when things didn't go my way. So I can speak with the enthusiasm of a convert because I know how, how debilitating and detrimental that type of attitude was back then and how I've tried to course correct and have a different approach now. So from, from burnout, I can speak from my heart and really burnout comes when you, you take a look at the work you put in, the sacrifices you make, the hours that you devote, and if that's not in alignment with things that you enjoy, with things that you're fascinated or curious about, if that's not in alignment with a feeling of contribution, like you feel like you're making a difference, if those things aren't happening, you're at super high risk of burnout. People tend to think of burnout simply on the physiological, which, you know, you're working 18, 19 hour days, you're not getting enough sleep. That is a form, that is a type of burnout and that can certainly contribute. Um, but if you're deep in your passion and your purpose, 
you can actually have a pretty rigorous work schedule and you're not at risk of burnout because you find so much meaning in what it is that you're doing. So to me, that's where we have a problem. Burnout is when the meaning you find from your work splinters in a different direction than the sacrifices you're making. So we want all of that to be in alignment. If you're working 18 hour days, I want that to be because you're choosing to work 18 hour days because you love the work so much, there's nothing else you'd rather do. And this is not a PSA to encourage people to work that much. I'm a huge believer in having harmony and integration where we have other aspects of our lives besides work. In fact, I actually take a tremendous amount of pride in my own life. And this is going to sound really weird at how little I work. Like I, I'm a minimalist at heart. And my goal is what is the minimum dosage that I can put into something to get a maximum return? So my goal is to be the best speaker that I'm capable of and run a thriving speaking practice. But I want to do so working the minimal amount of hours that are required to be that good. So that way I can spend the rest of that time, you know, with my girlfriend, with my children, with, uh, you know, doing other things. So this is not a more is better, but that the key going back to burnout is just making sure that, that the meaning, the purpose, the fascination, the curiosity, the sense of contribution, all of that is in perfect alignment with what you're doing. And if you can have the self-awareness and the humility and vulnerability to acknowledge that it's not, then you need to start figuring out what tweaks need to be made. And you don't have to completely leave one industry and go to another. You don't even have to leave your job and go to another, but you need to start figuring out how you can start to get these things in alignment. You know, maybe you've been working at a job for 10 years and, you know, there's been some turnover. There's been a change in leadership at, at, the, at your job and, you know, you don't seem to jive with the new leadership as well. And maybe that's causing some of the issue. Maybe you've maximized your contribution in a certain role and, and the team needs to put you on an, another position or a different role to kind of get that back. Or maybe you've been in a specific industry or with a team for a long time and you need to feel reinvigorated by going and doing something else. So there's a lot of things from very, very small pivots to massive life changes that one can try to figure out what they need to do to, to kind of get that love back and completely extinguish burnout. Yeah, that all of this is so important. And I've been there myself as well. I'm an entrepreneur now, but I've worked in the corporate world and I've hit that point of, I feel like I've maxed out here and I don't know what to do. And I felt like there weren't resources available to me, or I didn't know what resources to look to, to help me in that situation. You know, my, my boss didn't entirely know what to do for me. The leadership didn't know what to do for me. I had a whole bunch of conversations and nobody was telling me the answer. What would you suggest to somebody who feels like they're in situ in that situation? Do you have a process or something that they can turn to maybe your book, something that they could turn to that will support them in that situation? Well, the first thing you need to do in any of these areas where we feel a little bit stuck or a little bit confused is we got to give ourselves some grace and some space to be human. Like we have to treat ourselves with the same compassion that we would treat a loved one or a friend if they came to us with the same issue. Uh, what I tend to find with most high performers, and I know that is the majority of your audience, high performers uh, tend to be very self-critical. Um, they, they tend to stack on shame and judgment and, and guilt, you know, when things aren't going well. And, and they probably have internal conversations like, why am I complaining about my job? I have an amazing job for a great company. I make a great living. You know, who am I to, to say that's not good enough? And, and we have to take that judgment out and, and just remember that anyone listening to this, no matter what struggle you're going through, you are definitely not alone. You know, no, you, your problems in the way that you're experiencing them and through your experience might feel very unique to you. But I promise you, if you're listening to this right now and you're, you're feeling some early onset burnout, you are not the only person in the world feeling burnout right now. So just keep in mind, that's part of the human condition. So the first thing you have to do is give yourself some permission and grace to feel however you're feeling. And then you need to just be able to own it. Part of the, the issue is most people out of embarrassment or any other reason tend to suppress these feelings or it's guilt. You know, they, they tend to suppress this burnout feeling. And, and I think even when I was younger, you know, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old. So I'm kind of a product of the eighties and nineties, you know, there, there really wasn't this focus on mental health or emotional intelligence or a lot of the things that, that we talk about today, which is a great thing. You know, I kind of grew up in the, you know, suck it up buttercup generation, which is like, you know, just what, what do you mean you don't like your job? Who cares? Do your job. Like, this is your job. It's supposed to be a job. It's work. That's why. And it's like, no, that it doesn't have to be. 
Like I'm allowed to pick something that not only is hard work, but is also fulfilling and is something that that challenges me and something that I enjoy. You know, I think life is way too short um, to not try and check all of those different boxes. So you know, the last thing you want to do is stack shame or guilt or judgment or criticism on top of however you're feeling. And, and I would talk to your, you know, your inner board of directors or your inner circle, the people closest to you. The people that you know unequivocally love you, care about you, and want to see you happy and share some of these thoughts with them, you know, and and depending on uh, your work situation, you know, depending on the type of, if you do work for someone else, you know, maybe you have the type of boss or or leader that is open to having these conversations because it's in their best interest to have an employee that shows up every day as the best version of themselves. So if you're showing up every day and you're just a fraction of who you could be because you're not enjoying your work, like not only are you making your life miserable, you're not adding very much value to the team. Like you're hurting the team's chance of being successful too. So it might be a very helpful conversation to have with some of your colleagues or coworkers or the people that you work for. But I think the number one step is to just own it, acknowledge it, and talk about the elephant in the room. And then you can start to navigate through some resources. And and the last thing on that, the other big change between growing up in the 80s and 90s and being here now entering 2024 is there is no shortage of solid resources and information out there. I mean, every single one of us is a click away from a blog or a video or a podcast or in today's day and age, a masterclass literally on how to improve any area of our life. So the information is out there. Uh, we just need to be the ones to go seek it. And you need to care enough about yourself and care enough about your own happiness and fulfillment that you don't delay that another day. Yeah, this is such an important conversation. What you've shared about, yeah, I was a 80s and 90s child as well. And growing up during that time, the suck it up buttercup mentality and the you should be happy with what you've got mentality. I think that can become a a real situation with burnout because you reach this level where it's like, I should be happy. This feeling of I I should be happy. This is what I was told would get me to happiness. Even especially if somebody is to that level of feeling like financially, I should be happy right here. And yet we're not. And I think one of the things that you've alluded to a little bit that really contributes to burnout too, is that burnout is, it's an opportunity for you to grow. You've maxed out somewhere with your contribution and the world needs you to contribute in a new way or in a different way or in a slightly edited way or in a new role, whatever that might be. And so it's an opportunity to look and see, ah, where could I be helping other people more? Where could I be helping this company more? Absolutely. We, you, you said something there that I think we should kind of du- double click on. And that's, I do believe we live in a society that has kind of told us what success and happiness is supposed to be or where we're supposed to derive it. And many of those things are the external trappings. We've kind of been told that if you make this much money or you have this title or you live in this house or you have this many followers on social, if you have these things, then you are successful. And if you are successful, you should also be happy. And those things have been linked. Whereas I'm a huge believer, each and every one of us has the right and the obligation to define our own success and define our own happiness and fulfillment. We don't have to take that from everybody else. And and once again, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with those external trappings. I mean, everything I just mentioned, uh, those are things that I, I want to achieve and accumulate in my own life. The big difference is that's not where I get my sense of self from. That's not where I get my self-belief and my confidence and my optimism from those things. If I gain or lose 5,000 Instagram followers in a day, uh, I'll be curious to why that happened, but it will have zero impact on how I show up in the world or how I feel about myself as a man or as a human being. Cause I, I don't want to give that power away to anybody else. Um, so to me, all of us, what we need to do is we need to get crystal clear on a, on a North star, if you will. What, what, what do I consider to be a life well-lived? You know, what do I consider um, happiness and fulfillment and joy and success and high performance? What does that look like? And then how can I kind of reverse engineer and unpack that and design a life accordingly? And, and to me, that's what's most important. 
all of us have way more power than we believe. We tend to give it away to everyone else and let everyone else kind of be the decision makers. So, you know, uh, and, and even, you know, financially is, is one of the big ones. You know, I can see where someone feels in a trap. If they're earning a really good living in a job, but they don't tend to love that job, I totally can resonate and have empathy on why they would feel a little trapped. Like, who am I to be... Cl- complaining when I make this much a year and I can afford all of these external trappings. Well, if you're not really having a sense of purpose or or feeling enjoyment from that work, uh, I've met plenty of people in my life who would gladly take a 50% pay cut to leave that grind and go do something that they really love because they've figured out that money and the external trappings is not the key. Those things can be very supplemental. And, and, and I like nice things. I like nice clothes. I like nice vacations. I love eating good food. Again, this is not about placing judgment on any of that. It's about deciding what really fills your bucket and then living a life that, that is in alignment with that. And, and the beautiful part is, as we said very early in the conversation, you know, you can make that choice at any time in your life. You know, uh, this concept that's constantly playing in my head right now and, and this might end up being the third book I end up writing as long as along the lines of the second half. You know, I'm a big sports guy, basketball guy. So, you know, in basketball, you've got two halves. And um, I am also a believer because I take really good care of myself physically and emotionally. Um, I plan to live to 100. Now, I know that there's nothing that will guarantee that. This all can be over tomorrow for all I know. But I'm, I'm going to live my life as if I'm going to live another 50 years. So I'm basically at halftime of my life right now. And I did the first half. And there were parts of the first half that were amazing. I'm so grateful. There were other parts of the first half that were painful and were challenging. And I did and said some really boneheaded things. So my goal is to take the lessons from the first half and apply them to the second half. I, without question, absolutely believe that my best years are still ahead of me, that my second 50 will be way better than my first 50. And that's saying a lot because I had a pretty good first half. So to me, I get fueled up and excited and optimistic to be able to take all of these things, including the bumps and the bruises and the scars and applying them to the second half and making this next 50, my best 50. So, you know, you can look backwards and say, man, why was I in this job for 15 years? I hated every second of it. Or you can say, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm so excited for the next 15 years, you know, per this show, I'm going to untether from what I had before. And I'm going to completely relinquish and let go. I'm going to drop this anchor that I've been carrying around. And I'm so excited for the next 15. Yeah. And you, I love this idea. I love this concept. Please write that book of the second half because it's, we can make a choice at any point. And I think a lot of us are so inspired by stories of celebrity, of course, of people who it's like, they didn't start until they were 50. It's like Morgan Freeman didn't get his first acting job until so late in life. We're so inspired by that. And so my question for you is how do we? How do we untether? You have this mindset. Somebody could be listening and saying, yes, I love what he's saying. I want to have that mindset too. Like, What are the traits that we can begin to develop that can help us to look into that next, into that second half, into that next 50 years with the optimism that you have? Well, everything always starts with awareness. Awareness is always the first step to improvement in any area of our life. And I know that because you'll never improve something you're unaware of and you'll never fix something you're oblivious to. So the very first step is coming to an awareness that you are actually unhappy or unfulfilled and then digging even deeper and having an awareness of the source of what's creating your unhappiness or for not feeling fulfilled. And doing that, I don't want you to gloss over that. That is a huge step in the right direction to be able to say, you know, I'm willing to admit, I'm willing to be vulnerable and I'm going to speak out into the universe that I am actually unhappy right now. I am not living my purpose-driven life. I'm not feeling fulfilled and I'm going to go even deeper and figure out why that is. And when you can really get to the root of that, that is a major first step. So don't gloss over that. Actually have some pride in the fact that you're willing to be courageous enough uh, to say that. Next, I'm a huge believer in environment. I think our environment has a massive impact on everything we we do in our lives. So one of the things that I try and do habitually in every area of my life is I try to put myself in rooms and I try to be around people that are doing what I aspire to do. You know, I just said I, I got back from this speaker boot camp where I'm I'm trying to work on my craft. And while I'm always there to try and help 
uh, anyone else that may be just starting. That's very important to me because I've had a lot of people help me. You know who I spent most of my time with at that boot camp? Were the speakers that are three, four, five years down the line from where I am. The speakers that are earning two to three times what I am and on the type of stages that I aspire to be on. Those were the people that I was I was hanging around as much as possible. So I want to try and be around people that their normal is my aspiration. You know, I want to be in a room where I am certainly never the wisest or most accomplished person in the room. And, and if, if I am, then I'm in the wrong room, then I need to find another room to be in. And it's the same with this. If you're feeling stuck, if you're feeling pessimistic, if you're feeling like you can't find purpose, try to find people that are doing those things at a high level. And, and the beautiful part is when I say find those people, um, I, re- I just realized I'm doing a lot of air quotes. If that gets obnoxious, just tell me and I'll stop doing them. Especially, I know we've got some audio listeners, but I normally don't do them as often as I've been doing them. But but the beautiful part is this doesn't just mean in person anymore. You know, on You can follow people online, follow social profiles of people that are living the type of life that you believe you want to live. Now, that is the one danger on the social side is we don't know how real or authentic that is. We don't know if you know everything that they're posting on Instagram is genuine and authentic in their real life or they're just putting up the stuff we want they want us to see. So I know that that could be a potential red flag or a, a, a mind that we could step on. Uh, but generally speaking, seek out people that are living the type of life that you want to live and try to spend as much time with them as you can. And if time means watching their videos, listening to their podcast, or reading their books, that's certainly a portion of it. Because you know the, the outputs we put in the world are directly related to our inputs. And what we read, watch, and listen to is kind of our, our information diet. It, it feeds our, our mental and emotional wellness and has a huge impact on how we see the world, how we navigate the world, how we treat others, how we show up. So if you ever feel stagnant uh, in your outputs, you need to shake up your inputs. Change what you read, watching, and listening to, and change who's in proximity in your life. Change who you are spending time with on a regular basis. And if you can level those things up, then then I think that's going to start to generate some of the momentum needed to make whatever change you need to make. Uh, And again, it doesn't mean you have to quit your job tomorrow. It doesn't mean you have to to leave your, your current profession and pick another industry. It might just be a subtle change. It might be you're working in one department and you put in a request to work in another department or to work for someone else or to have a different role. Or maybe you pick up a side hustle and you start doing that. And as that starts to generate enjoyment and purpose, you build that momentum to the point your side hustle can become your main hustle. So there's a million ways to attack it. uh, But the first is to acknowledge it and have an awareness of it and have the courage to speak it into the world. Second is start to change your environment and put yourself in rooms where people are doing what you aspire to do. Yes, yes, and more yes. And I have lived this through my own experience, and I know a lot of lis- listeners have as well. One of the things that I really made a huge shift about was when I see somebody that's inspiring me, a lot of times I would feel jealousy or I would feel the not a, not good enoughness. And the huge shift for me, Alan, was when I realized that that was my higher self. That was what was possible for me. And when we can make that shift, anybody who you look at and you say, oh my gosh, I want to be doing that, it's 100% possible for you because you're just seeing your gifts reflected back at you. So when we can start to put ourselves in the rooms with those people, because you already have that capability. You have that capacity. There just might be skills that you need to learn or things you need to learn from them. And so it's flipping out of that jealousy and into that possibility for yourself that I feel like makes such a big difference. I don't know if you've experienced that. It's like the the little tinge of jealousy that we can see in other people and we have to kind of make that little switch. Absolutely. I'm so glad you went in that direction. You know, if if I were to list the things that I'm I'm trying to be most intentional about leveling up in my life. You you just hit one of them right there. And that is kind of going from a, a scarcity mindset to an abundant mindset. And I fully acknowledge that almost 48 years old, I've spent about 43, 44, if I'm honest, probably 45 years 
in, in the scarcity mindset. And it's kind of how I was raised. And that is not in any way to demean my parents or the environment I grew up in, grew up in a very loving household, but, but I was kind of raised with this scarcity mindset that there's never enough. Um, and when I say never enough, I'm going to have to do my air quotes again, because I'm not just talking about money. It's there's never enough of, of any resource that we want. And I've been so intentional these last two to three years of trying to change that and have an abundance mindset. Cause really to me at the root of jealousy, is scarcity. We're jealous that someone else has something because we believe that we can't also have it if they have it. We're looking at it like it's zero sum when it's not. Instead, we should be cheering each other on. We should be rooting our fellow human beings on when someone else is successful or happy. We should be thankful that they are. Because as you said, that just is proving ground that we can do the same thing. You know, And I still occasionally revert back. I mean, currently as a speaker, I mean, in full transparency, and vulnerability. There are times where I hear of someone getting a, a speaking engagement that I had hoped to get. And I do feel that twinge of jealousy. But what I have now, going back to awareness, I have an awareness that that is not a very helpful emotion. It's important because it's bringing something to the surface that I need to be able to wrestle with. It it shows me an area of my life that I'm not free, but at least I'm able to say, you know, well, why am I feeling jealous of that person? Well, because it's making me feel like I'm less than or I'm not good enough. They got the speaking gig, which then means I'm not as good of a speaker. And that's not a truth. That's a story that I'm telling myself, and I don't have to tell myself that story. I should be thankful that somebody is willing to pay for someone to be on their stage because the more people that do that, the, the better my livelihood is going to be. You know, when I meet speakers that have, you know, two to three times the fee that I have or on stages that are two to three times bigger, I'm so grateful for that because they're proving, as you said so perfectly and insightfully, what's possible. You know, whoever out, whoever's speaking out there whose speaking fee is twice mine, I am cheering for them like I'm the biggest cheerleader in the world because that's, that's my future. Those people are raising the ceiling of what's going to be possible for me. And I also realize, you know, I hope this doesn't sound like it lacks humility, but I'm that avatar for somebody else. Somebody else is looking at where I am in the speaking business and they're trying to get to my level. And that's great. I don't, I don't want them to be jealous of anything I'm doing because I want to send that elevator back down and be able to help them as well. So for me, I still feel that twinge of jealousy fairly often if I'm being honest, but what happens now uh, it, within a matter of seconds, if not a matter of minutes, I can course correct, talk myself off of that ledge, say, don't, don't be jealous of them, cheer them on the way you want others cheering you on, a- admire and respect their mastery of craft, you know, acknowledge the fact that they've probably done some things that I haven't done that have earned them the opportunity to be on that stage. You know, let's not make an assumption that they just got there because they were lucky or because someone liked them better. For all I know, they're they're doing something different in their process. So what can I learn from this? So instead of leaning in with jealousy or, or leaning in with frustration or judgment or criticism, why don't I lean in with curiosity or fascination and go, man, how did that person get their speaking business to that level? Like, I'm fascinated by that. What can I learn from what they're doing and apply it to my own business and my own life so that I can continue to thrive? So every area of my life now, I'm trying to have more of an abundant mindset. And it's definitely not easy. I mean, it is a daily conditioning of the mindset. But here's what I can say with great pride, because I certainly haven't mastered it yet. There's something that could happen later this evening after we record that makes me jealous. So I'm not immune to it. But what I can do is remind myself that I'm going in the right direction, that 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 I feel and experience jealousy less now than I did two years ago, four years ago, or six years ago. You know, I'm less judgmental and critical of others and of myself than I was two, four, six years ago. So I'm not anywhere close to mastery in any of these areas, but I'm trending in the right direction. And to me, that's the most important part. I don't concern myself so much with where I am at the moment. I put much more on the direction I'm headed. And as long as my personal arrow in every area of life is pointing up or pointing forward, however you want to describe it, then I feel really good about that. Yeah. I think I can speak on behalf of anybody who's listening to this podcast. Thank you for your honesty about the jealousy. It is an emotion that every human feels and it's that awareness that is so huge and your curiosity is one of your greatest assets and you have an abundance. If we speak about abundance, you have an abundance of curiosity. Your curiosity is liquid gold that is always going to lead you to amazing and fascinating and wonderful and more abundant 
places. So everything that you just shared there is so liquid gold. And one of the things that occurred to me, just speaking from a basketball perspective, that it's this concept that there's enough pie for everyone. And I'm thinking about a basketball player who I know and love, who is Fred Van Vliet. He now plays for, who does he play for? He played for the Raptors, but I think he moved. He was with Wichita State University, which is my alma mater. And he is five foot seven, five foot eight. And nobody would ever guess that this guy would make it to the level of NBA play that he has made it to and in the way that he plays because he is not selfish. He is so humble. He gets the ball. He gives it to somebody else. He's always feeding it to everybody else. And he has risen through this strategy of you know, seeing opportunities, taking them, and then supporting other people with it as well. And it just made me think of you and the other speakers and you looking at them and they're offering their wisdom to you and it's helping you rise. And together you're helping other people rise just as he has made so many other players so much better because he himself is so willing to give and to also, you know, take the steps that he needs to take forward. And so anyway, it just was really making me think of him and the way that he plays. And if we could all be that humble and humility just seems like the thematic of this conversation too. And, yes. and just being, showing up, offering our gifts and that abundance mindset is so, so huge. Oh yeah. And, and right in line with humility is selflessness and, and, and having a servant's heart. And once again, you know, I can say, and I say all of this with a smile because I've forgiven my previous self, but that's not who I was 20 years ago. You know, 20 years ago, I was incredibly scared and insecure and selfish. And I would only give with the expectation that you would now owe me and I was going to receive. So I was the king of scorekeeping in every single relationship. And none of that led to any level of happiness or fulfillment or enjoyment or or really uh, high performance, to be honest. So to me, these are all things that I'm trying to unwire and do differently. Now, with that said, I have forgiven my previous self because it doesn't do me any good to cling to and judge and criticize you know, who I was 20 years ago. Um, I, I remind myself that at that time, I was navigating the world the best way that I was capable of with the tools and the awareness I had at the time. I just didn't have very many tools or very much awareness. So yeah, of course I'm going to make some very boneheaded decisions and and do things in a in a way that didn't serve me because I didn't know any better. But now I do know better. And when you know better, you need to do better. So, you know, it's not fair for me to compare 48-year-old Alan to 28-year-old Alan. You know, there's a lot that's transpired in those 20 years. And I'm thankful because if I was the same person I was 20 years ago, I will have wasted 20 years of my life. You know, right now I'm navigating the world to the best of my ability, but you better believe when 68 year old Alan looks back at 48 year old Alan, he'll probably shake his head at a couple things and go, man, you could have done that. Of course, that's the gift of hindsight. And we always have that. So yeah, to me, this, this learning to, to give and, and without expectation, give without keeping score to be of service and add value to others. If you find actual enjoyment in that, once again, that's the process you've already won in advance. So being selfless, being humble, um, you know, and, and sometimes I think people unfortunately have a connotation and that that means that you're weak, you know, that in order to get ahead in this capitalistic world, you know, you've got to be cutthroat and you've got to be willing to step on necks and you've got, no, that is not true. You know, whoever came up with the phrase that, that nice guys finish last, I don't agree with that. Uh, I absolutely believe you can be a nice solid human being. You can be, have a servant's heart. You can add value and you can be an extraordinary performer in a variety of different ways. So I, I love hearing about your, your friend that despite the odds ascended to the highest level of basketball possible. And he did that by sharing the sugar and passing the pill and get other people involved and, you know, maximizing his role on the team and not worrying about his stats or his minutes or his playing time, but doing whatever he needed to do to make a maximum contribution for the greater good of the team. And uh, trust me, anyone that has that mindset is highly coveted in the business world. You know, one of the most important skills we can develop as human beings is the ability to make other people better. If your mere presence in a room raises the overall level and temperature of that room, as you said before so insightfully, that is liquid gold. There is not a company in this world that won't pay you to be a part of their organization if your mere presence makes everybody better. And, and that's just 
being servant. That's being open. That's wanting to make a contribution. That's not caring about who gets the credit, but caring about doing a good job to the best of your ability. So these are all things that, once again, I I didn't do a very good job of these 10, 15, 20 years ago. I'm starting to get the hang of them now, but I just like where my arrow's pointed because I'm going to get even better at all of these things at 58, 68, 78, all the way up to 98. Yeah. And what's so cool is that you've been sharing all along the way. You've been showing up with your gifts all along the way. Even if we're never doing it perfect, you're continuing to move along and you're sharing right now, knowing that someday you'll look back and say, oh my goodness, why did you say that or do that or think that? Like That's just, it. that is part of humility is showing up in your full gifts as they are exactly today, knowing that there's room to continuously improve. So, Well, thank you. you. Well, I'm I'm going to give you an actual speaking. So here, here's how I view speaking. So as I said, I'm going into my eighth year as a corporate speaker. And I can say with a huge smile, anytime I see clips or footage from my first year of speaking, it literally makes my stomach turn. It is so cringeworthy to see what I did back in 2017. But where I can smile and laugh like you are right now is in 2017, that was the best I was capable of. Like, it wasn't like I was sandbagging or doing, that was, that was where I was at that time. But here's the beautiful part. Uh, I always believe when anyone says, you know, what's the best keynote you've ever given? My answer, and, and I don't mean this to be sarcastic. I mean it sincerely. When someone says, what's the best keynote? I always say it's the next one. Like I haven't given it yet. My best keynote is still in me. I have not done it yet. It will be the very next one that's on my calendar, regardless of the size of the audience or the size of the stage. My next one will be my best. That's how I approach it. Um, So I already know with that mentality that the next keynote I give, I'm hoping is the best that I've ever done. Yet with that said, I can tell you that 10 years from now, I hope that I look back on the next keynote I'm about to give and shake my head. And it's like, oh man, that wasn't very good. Because that would mean that I have improved to the level that my current best is so far in the rear view mirror 10 years from now, but that means I'm going in the right direction. So I'm actually proud of the fact that I've gotten to a level that a speaking engagement I did in 2017, I now look at like it was Bush League. And I hope that 10 years from now, I look back at the keynotes I gave in 2023 and go, yeah, that was a good try, young fella. But man, you're not anywhere close to as good as you are now. That's the goal. I want to keep getting better. I don't want to reach my peak and my pinnacle and then start going back down the mountain. I want to keep going up, you know, and and I'm thankful that I've chosen a vocation that unless something changes, I mean, I could do this for the next 30, 40, or 50 years. You know, I plan to be spry enough in my late seventies and early eighties that I'll still be a keynote speaker. And at that time, I hope I am so good at my craft that everything I'm doing right now looks looks juvenile in comparison. Can't wait for it. You're going to be the Dick Vital of the corporate speaking world. We can't wait. So yes, and also, cool. I hope that what you just shared there, my next one will be my best. That is that is a chapter that is a part that is part and parcel of this next book that you're writing 100%. It's that same thematic and it's so powerful and a huge takeaway from this conversation. Alan, I ask everybody who comes on the, on the podcast this one last question. Where do you see the magic in the world? Just in caring and in love, I think inherently the overwhelming majority of every human being walking the earth is good, is is pure. I think people want to say and do the right things. I think there's so much hurt and so much fear and so much insecurity and so much polarization in so many different areas that, that people don't often put their best selves forward. And then what happens is we start arguing and disagreeing and we criticize and we judge like all of the things we've been talking about, when if you really take a step back, if you just acknowledge that almost everyone walking the earth is doing the best they can, you know, they're doing the best they can with their level of awareness. They're doing the best they can with their set of emotional tools. They're doing the best they can given their previous experiences. And let's just give people grace. Let, let's be a little slower to criticize and judge and instead be way more supportive Um, And and as we've said numerous times, uh, curious and and fascinated. And I think if we do that, like the world will be an even more magical place than it is right now. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for being out there and sharing this really important message and just being who you are. And where can people connect with you and where can they find you? 
Well, thanks. This was so much fun. I enjoyed this immensely. You are a fantastic interviewer uh, and you're a brilliant active listener. So this was this was really fun. Um, my main hub of everything I do is just allensteinjr.com. Uh, if anyone listening, if you're interested in my speaking services, uh, I do anything from keynotes to half-day workshops to full-day trainings. Uh, I also have two books, uh, Raise Your Game, uh, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, and Sustain Your Game, High Performance Keys to Manage Stress, Avoid Stagnation, and Beat Burnout. You can find those on Amazon or Audible or wherever you get your books and audiobooks. And then I'm very active on social media, uh, on LinkedIn, Instagram, and I, I guess we're calling it X now, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, but I'm just at Alan Stein Jr. on those platforms. I'm very accessible and very responsive. Uh, so feel free to shoot me a DM on Instagram or LinkedIn. If any part of this conversation resonated or if there's any part that you want to continue uh, to discuss or ask or share, I love engaging with folks. So this was a lot of fun. So I'm very easy to find and very good about getting back to people. Amazing. I love that. And that is part and parcel of who you are and what you do and what you speak about too, being so accessible and really listening to people. So all of those links are in the show notes. Everyone, please go connect with Alan. You're going to want to see what else he puts out. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Alan. One of the big takeaways, which is what we titled this podcast episode with, is this idea of really falling in love with the work. Now, those of us who grew up in the 80s, 90s, maybe even earlier, maybe even a little bit after if you're a very young listener of this podcast, might have grown up feeling like it was the outcome. It was the gold ribbon. It was the gold star. It was the A plus that we are striving for. Y'all, I could not get high enough. I had a history teacher in high school one time who definitely poked some fun at me for my 124% that I had in his class. I was striving for the best that it could ever possibly be. And I was not enjoying that class at all whatsoever. Hated it. Hated every minute of getting to that 124%. I was simply striving for how high it could be and how many of us are living our lives that way. I have spent the last decade really dismantling that and coming back home to falling in love with every single moment so that I can be enjoying today. And that's what Alan is truly talking about, is being present with the things that you love right now, today, and knowing that it's going to get better and better and better. So whatever takeaways you had from this conversation are so perfect. That is one of them that just really, really hit home for me. If there was something that you took away from this conversation and you'd like to share it with a friend, you'd like to share it with someone else, please do that. Share Untethered with Jen List, this podcast right here. You're also welcome to take a little screenshot of your listening platform, whether that's Apple Podcasts or Spotify or somewhere else. If you go share that on social media, on Instagram, I'm Untethered Jen. You can find Alan's tag in the show notes. Tag us. We will reshare your posts. We're both the kind of people who love to reshare your posts and get you seen as well. So go and do that. I will definitely reshare it. And I just appreciate so much that you would listen. Please keep shining your magical unicorn light out there for all to see. We'll see you next time.